Tubes is the name of the book. A Journey to the Center of the Internet is the subtitle, and the author is Andrew Blum. He joins us this week on The Communicators. Mr. Blum, why did you travel to Milwaukee when you were researching tubes? Well, the, the big challenge for me at the beginning was to try to make our virtual world as tangible as possible. And what I, when I found out that one of the major maps of the internet that I was looking at, a map made by a, a, a group in DC called Telegeography, was actually printed at a big printing press in Milwaukee, that they actually made the effort to, to travel there, uh, to sort of go and, and, and watch this thing come off this giant you know, school bus sized machine. Uh, that seemed like a great way into this story of figuring out not only where the internet is, but also trying to sort of meditate a bit and come to terms with what is still physical about our virtual world. And it turned out that one thing that is still, of course, physical is you know very large printing presses, and strangely enough, very large printing presses that print map that that print that print maps of the internet. Uh, so I followed my map maker, a guy named Marcus Krasetsa, there to see this map of the internet actually come off the press. Is there a center of the universe when it comes to the internet? Uh, there is, although I should say there isn't just one center. There are, I like to say, about a dozen buildings around the world that are by far the most important places of the internet. They are the places where more networks of the internet connect to each other than anywhere else. And they're mostly in places you'd expect, uh, New York, London, Frankfurt, Tokyo, with a couple really interesting outliers. And in the outliers was a lot of my story. Uh, places like Ashburn, Virginia, an unincorporated suburb not far from Dulles Airport, where if you ask internet people, if you ask the network engineers that I spend a lot of time with, you know, what are the capitals of the internet, they would say, oh, New York, London, Los Angeles, Ashburn, as if it were this global capital, not as if it were this tiny suburb. So those, those, are, the, those are the places, the surprisingly short list of places uh, that are by far the hotspots, the kind of super nodes on the global internet. What do these super nodes look like, uh, Mr. Blum, when you visit them? <laughs> uh, well, from the outside, they look a bit like a, you might say the, the loading dock of a, of a shopping mall. There are, there, they are quite generic uh, from the outside, deliberately so. They try to hide in plain sight, uh, at least when you're driving by them. Uh, inside, uh, some of them are, are, in, um, are in old uh, kind of Art Deco buildings that, uh, that used, to be, used to belong to Western Union or old telecom palaces. Uh, others are, uh, are kind of um, have what their, their operators like to call a cyberific look. Cyberific is kind of the, the aesthetic adjective of choice. Uh, meaning they kind of look like a science fiction movie, and that's deliberate. They, they're, meant, they're sort of modeled after uh, science fiction in order to appeal to the network engineers that are deciding where to put their network connections and where to connect to other networks. So when you walk in, it's, it's a bit like walking into a machine. Their, um, their buildings are incredibly, uh, inside, they're incredibly loud, uh, fr incredibly cold from all the air conditioners that keep the equipment cool. Uh, you often can't see the ceiling because it's obscured with, with cables. And there are usually um, cages around, uh, you know, big steel cages, kind of um, you know, maybe a half the size of a hotel room, uh, that, are, that each, each belongs to a network. And that's where they, they keep their equipment securely and then run a wire up to the top of the cage and drop it down into the, net, into the cage of another network and interconnect that way. That is the actual physical interconnection in the internetwork. When you look at the infrastructure of the wires uh, of the internet, what are those wires made of? And, and what are they carrying? The uh, predominantly at the, the, the centers of the internet, these, you know, these, these, these most important places, they are fiber optic cables. They're often yellow fiber optic jumper cables, the kind of, this kind of basic unit of connection. And inside of them are, are, are essentially strands of glass. And inside of that glass, are pulses of light, kind of nanosecond, uh, nanosecond Morse code uh, that, can, um, you know, that, that can carry kind of at a, at, a, at a baseline these days about usually 10 gigabits per second of data, so maybe a thousand times your, your home connection. And that's, that's everywhere you go when you visit the internet, you see these yellow, yellow jumper cables. And that is, that is, again, the intern internet. That is the actual connection between networks. The fiber optic cables, are those state of the art right now, Andrew Blum? Uh, well, they are, and but what's interesting is that actually, it, the the cable itself is 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 a is a glass tube. It's the it's the kind of you know the flickering flashlight on one end and the receiver on the other that where the where the magic happens, you could say. And what's striking is that every few years, uh, those signals are now are transmitted faster. A, a, a two gig optical module, it's called a kind of 
thing about the size of a pack of Wrigley's gum and costing about as much of a laptop is swapped out. This year's model is put in and suddenly that, that same strand of fiber is carrying 10 gigabits per second. Next year it might be 40 or 100 gigabits per second. So the, the state of the art uh, for the fiber itself isn't, isn't changing. It's really the, 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 the pieces on either end. If you would, please define what a network is and, and describe it to us. Sure. That, that is the kind of holy grail of, of understanding what the internet is, particularly in physical terms. Uh, a network in terms of an internet network, a network on the internet, is known as an autonomous system. It operates autonomously. It might be of, of any scale. Uh, it might be a huge global network like Verizon's or Deutsche Telekom's. It might be the network of a, of a law firm that perhaps only you know, spans only from New York to Los Angeles. Uh, might be a network like Facebook or Google. But what's, what's striking and what's necessary to understand the way it, 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 it manifests itself physically is that networks carry networks. You, have a, you might have a, a global backbone company like a Level 3 or, or, a, uh, or a Tata that own the strands of glass uh, and that own the conduits that might run perhaps beside railroad tracks across the country. You might have another company, perhaps a, a sort of mid-size network services company like a, one called Hurricane Electric that might actually illuminate those strands of glass. They might own the light. And then you might have a, another company, uh, might be a Goldman Sachs or a lar large law firm that, that buys bandwidth on that, on that glass. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, we often talk about the information superhighway as if the, the, the network itself were the highway. Uh, I like to think of it more that the, the, the network, a given network is a car along, you know, chugging along the highway side by side with other networks. Uh, because there's a there's definitely a layering going on that's um, that's crucial to understanding the way in which uh, the the networks of the internet operate individually on a global basis, but then of course have to interconnect in very specific places. Is there any fear that uh, messages or whatever is being carried on those uh, uh, networks through those networks could get lost, such as if you took a, the wrong off ramp on a highway? Uh, certainly, yeah. I mean the. Um, you know they they are they are encoded with with uh, with with their address. You you know that, that if to, to continue the metaphor, uh, and um, and some, sometimes those end up in the wrong place. Usually because, you know it's it's based on trust. The the routing system is based on trust. It's based on a network saying, I'm over here, and here are all the networks behind me. Here are all the networks you can reach through me. Uh, but that announcement is not is not you know is is, is not is not prescribed or is not is not really regulated. It's based on the the uh, the competence and 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 trust of a given network engineer. So occasionally, and this actually just happened last week, uh, a network will say, actually, you know, these networks are behind me when in fact they aren't. Uh, that happened most famously when um, uh, Pakistan Telecom said, "Hey, uh, I am YouTube." I meant to say, "I'm not YouTube." I meant to say, "You can't get to YouTube for me." But I, I, you know, entered the string and wrong, and and I now the entire world is beating down my door, thinking I'm YouTube. And needless to say, YouTube wasn't there. So, so it's it really. I mean, that's that was what amazed me again and again was was how how personal these interconnections were, how much they they really depended on one network engineer trusting another network engineer to basically configure his or her router properly. We are talking with Andrew Blum. He is the author of Tubes: A Journey to the Center of the Internet. He is also a staff writer at Wired Magazine. Mr. Blum, you described uh, a company, Level 3, as an internet backbone company. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. uh, they own very large physical pieces of the internet. They operate a, a global network, meaning uh, they, are, they have rights or, or might own outright uh, strands of glass alongside the road or a railroad track. And more importantly, they then own this optical equipment that illuminates the fibers and transmits the data, uh, and then sell that to to any anyone who's interested. Whether you know, it could be another network, it could be uh, a, a gov large government organization. In fact, the government is one of Level Three's major customers. Uh, but what they're doing is essentially they they are the ones who are allowing the internet to be global. They're the ones that are making the long distance connections and are the kind of base layer. Uh, that then allows all of the other sort of more familiar network names that we might know, the, the Facebooks and the Googles, uh, to, to ride on top of that. So, Andrew Blum, if, if somebody here in Washington sent an email to somebody in Kenya, where, how does that yeah. track? How does that track? Uh, you could be, uh, well, it's interesting. If you asked that question two years ago, the answer would be different. Uh, today, uh, only recently now, 
uh, does Kenya have good uh, direct physical connections to the internet rather than relying on satellite transmissions. So you can be, uh, I can almost guarantee you that an email from Washington to Kenya would go through a, a building in Ashburn, Virginia, a complex of buildings owned by a company called Equinex. It would then, I could be 80% sure, would then go through uh, 60 Hudson Street uh, here in Lower Manhattan, which is one of the major sort of uh, the major nodes, the kind of uh, you know international airport, you could say, uh, for the transatlantic cables, the, the 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 undersea cables that cross the Atlantic and transmit the vast majority of information. And then I can almost guarantee you that it would go through a single building in London, a building called Telehouse, uh, which is the kind of uh, UK and really Europe equivalent to Ashburn and 60 Hudson, these two buildings in the US. Uh, and I know that in particular because the two cables down the east coast of Africa both have their major, their major hubs, their major nodes uh, at Telehouse in, uh, in the Docklands in London. Uh, and from there it's a straight shot to a landing station in Mombasa. Uh, again, a, a sort of fascinating place, partly because it, it's, it's, it exactly, it, it, it is in the same spot as the, as the kind of the, the ancient port. You know, this is always the, the, the place. Uh, where um, where the where the where the, the international links have been made, Andrew Blum. When were these undersea cables that you referred to laid, and by whom? Uh, well, there, well, there, there have been uh, telegraph cables across the Atlantic for 150 years now. The current generation of cables, uh, of which, depending on how you count, whether you say individual strands or cable systems, which are sometimes two or even even three individual strands. There are uh, about eight or ten, or, or some 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 say some call it twelve of them across the Atlantic. The current generation was all laid uh, since the the broadband boom in the mid '90s. In the kind of uh, probably first one was finished, I think in '97, uh, up until about the 2002 when the last one was completed. And they're owned by a, a, a few different kinds of companies. Uh, they're owned either by uh, very large backbone companies uh, like like Level Three you mentioned. They're owned by consortia of telecoms, uh, Verizon joining with, uh, with British Telecom, uh, joining with Deutsche Telekom perhaps, uh, or a couple of them now uh, are owned by kind of boutique companies that only own cables across the Atlantic. I'm thinking in particular of a cable owned by a company called Hibernia Atlantic that had, had uh, bought their cable out of bankruptcy, out of the failure of a, of a larger telecom in the 2002, 2003, 2004 period, and now are, are, are operating uh, operating it uh, almost as if it were a little airline, saying, you know, we, we specialize in New York to London, and we, we will sell you services perhaps to a, to a large bank or to a, another telecom or, or, or anyone who needs high capacity bandwidth across the Atlantic. What about the Pacific? What about the Indian Ocean? Uh, the uh, Pacific is a, um, it's a, uh, again, a kind of similar combination of players. Uh, one interesting cable across the Pacific, the Unity Cable, uh, is actually partly owned by Google. Google runs a vast global network. They operate almost like a, a telecom of their own, and they um, and they actually uh, put you know put the, the the effort and money into 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 partly into, into building a new cable. I think it's about three years ago now that it was completed, and it speaks to the importance of this physical infrastructure. It speaks to the need for of large internet companies uh, to really have as much control as possible with their links uh, and that's um you know that 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 ends up sort of uh, with 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 the interesting consequences for the way in which the network operators talk about their geography another uh, important cable across the atlantic and pacific and and the indian ocean is owned by tata communications uh, the communications wing of tata the big indian industrial conglomerate and what i like about them is they they're really big on on marketing their kind of around the world capabilities they say we have a belt around the world if something might happen to our cable in the pacific if there's an underwater landslide or an anchor is dragged across it breaking it uh, we will send your bits around the other way to the east rather than to the west or to the west rather than the east and that kind of global geographic imagination uh, was something that really fascinated me about the the people who, uh, who run these global networks and who, who build and imagine what they should be. So Andrew Blum, a lot of redundancy in network communications and connections around the world? Indeed, yeah. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time with network engineers and uh, they are a, a cautious, you know, precise, extremely competent group. Uh, they're always forced to you know, do the most with the least, like a lot of people. Uh, but there is still a very strong telecom tradition of, a, of really building really robust networks. 
and then of course there are those uh, those companies that that are are you know uh, picking and choosing from other people's networks and sort of uh, assembling a global network of their own by 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 leasing capacity on different lines. And uh, I the, the, my, my favorite example there, and I, I I used to say this sort of half jokingly. But if the internet ever went down, the last network standing, the most robust network of all, would be Goldman Sachs's global network. And uh, that sort of uh, came vividly true in a slightly different realm with Hurricane Sandy last week in New York, two weeks ago now, uh, when uh, all of lower Manhattan was dark except for the Goldman Sachs tower because of the effort put into ensuring that their infrastructure is as, as robust and as fail safe as possible. So Andrew Blum, why is it that uh, Goldman Sachs uh, had that electricity and power going on when, like you said, the rest of Manhattan, 60 Hudson Street uh, being dark. Did, did 60 Hudson go down as well? Because I know we had a lot of problems even sending emails to New York from Washington and getting those connected. Yeah, 60 Hudson, uh, like essentially every other you know major internet building in New York, uh, switched over, in the case of 60 Hudson, switched over successfully to diesel power. Uh, uh, the week before last, the internet in New York ran on diesel. Uh, it was just it was as simple as that. They all have these these backup generators. When you when you when you visit one of these these big internet buildings, there's always the point in the tour uh, when you come to the school bus, when you come to this kind of hot still room uh, filled with a, with an enormous you know perhaps four megawatt diesel generator. And uh, last week, in the case of 60 Hudson, in the case of 111 Eighth Avenue, another another very important internet hub. A building that's actually owned owned entirely by Google. Uh, in both those cases, the generators did successfully switch over, and the internet was running on diesel. There were a couple stories that of, of data centers in Lower Manhattan that that did not successfully switch over. Maybe their generator was fine, uh, but in, in one prominent example, uh, a data center that brought down with it a lot of websites, a lot of prom a lot of um, a lot of well-known websites. The fuel pump was in the basement, and uh, if the fuel pump is in the basement and the basement's flooded. Uh, you can attempt, as they did, to have a bucket brigade of diesel fuel up the stairs. Uh, but that's a tough thing to do with the scale of power these buildings need. How reliant is the global internet uh, on satellites these days? Minimally, minimally. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's essentially a technology of last resort for the internet. Uh, it, you use it if there is no possibility of, of direct physical connections. And uh, there are, you know, fewer and fewer places in the world, fewer and fewer countries that do not now have uh, redundant uh, physical connections. That's that's you know most most remarkably that's 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 Africa. The last uh, uh, two or three years now have seen six new cables, three down each coast, where previously there was only one cable down the west coast. Uh, so as much you know as, as as much as possible, people are eager to to move away from satellite, not only because of the the high cost uh, and the the relatively low bandwidth. But because of what's known as the latency, the actual time delay in making that thirty thousand mile trip to space and back. So, Mr. Blum, these these uh, centers, sixty Hudson Avenue, uh, uh, London, et cetera, mm -hmm. Ashburn, Virginia, are these? When it comes to cybersecurity, are these would these be prime targets? No, I don't think they would be. Um, you know, for there, I, I mean, I, I take cybersecurity very seriously. Uh, but I, I think the far greater concern is, is the threat through the networks, not the threat to the physical infrastructure itself. Uh, these are buildings that are, are relatively well secured. They're buildings that, operate, that also operate redundantly with each other. You know, if, if you're uh, two major networks, say uh, Google and Comcast, uh, having to interconnect your networks, you'll set it up so you're connecting in Los Angeles and San Francisco, and you're also connecting uh, a, you know, a, a paired connection in, in New York and Washington, in Ashburn and 60 Hudson, perhaps, or probably in Google's case, 111 Eighth and, and Ashburn. Uh, and, and that's the recognition that, yes, you know, it might be uh, a storm. Uh, it, you know, it, it might be, God forbid, some sort of malicious attack, although I should say that's not something uh, I, I sense the network engineers losing a lot of sleep over. Uh, they're just they're not they're not they're they're not very good targets these buildings from a cybersecurity standpoint. Uh, there's worry they're highly they're highly secure because of concerns about theft, both theft of this very expensive equipment and theft of the information inside. But I was struck in 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 uh, in talking to people and 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 going to visit these places. Essentially, the higher up the food chain I got of people who owned and operated these buildings, the less concerned they were 
about talking about them, the less concerned they were about their physical security. In fact, the greater concern you know, was ignorance. The greater concern was that if we don't know about these buildings and know what, you know, what, what goes on inside of them and what the, what the issues are facing those operators, uh, the, the greater threat is from Washington. The greater threat is that, is that the internet will be legislated in a way uh, that, is not, uh, that is, 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 is not the best thing for the, the healthy functioning of the network, speaking technically. Andrew Blum, uh, you named your book Tubes. Where does that name come from? <laughs> Uh, it, Tubes comes from the, um, the, the, the famous comment in 2006 um, by Senator Ted Stevens from Alaska, who said, of course, that the internet is not a big truck. It's not something you can dump something on. It's a series of tubes. Uh, at the time, in 2006, we all, we all made fun of him. We laughed at him. You know, this was the, the height of ignorance on Washington's part. Uh, this, was the, this was an example of how the, the head of the Senate committee responsible for, for, for legislating the internet really had no idea what it was. But it struck me as, in fact, a, a, fairly, a fairly succinct way of describing what its physical infrastructure is. Uh, you know, I, I visited a lot of places of the internet, and whenever I did, uh, you look up at the ceiling, uh, you look in closets, and everywhere there are these, these metal conduits. Uh, I've spent a lot of time parsing the dictionary definition of a conduit versus a tube, and I'm, I'm pretty sure they're, uh, they're mostly the same thing. <laughs> is there some place that uh, anyone can access a map of the internet? Uh, sure, uh, quite a few. Um, the the uh, telegeography, in fact, uh, now has has put their their paper map of of uh, specifically the undersea cables. They've now done a great online version of that map, and that speaks to a kind of broader issue. Uh, you know, the the internet is not is not hidden. In fact, these these major nodes are are are, are public in an odd way. The, the people who interconnect there, the companies that own and operate them, are eager for, for, for others to know who is there and, and, and how important they are. Uh, you know, there's, it's, it's not as if um, this is something that, that everyone's hush-hush about. It's quite the opposite. This is, these, are, these are meeting points. These are, these are places where the networks that are, are, are operating inside of them want other networks to know that they're there. Uh, Mr. Blum, you mentioned Washington as somebody who follows technology and, and is a correspondent with Wired Magazine. Um, what's your impression of Washington and when it comes to policy, tech policy? Uh, I, I should say that I, it's, it's, not a, it's not something I have, I, have, I have covered very closely at all. Uh, in, in fact, um, you know, my, my interest runs more towards the, the way the internet smells and the history of, of, of why it is in these places rather than, 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 than in one place rather than another. Uh, Tubes is not, not a book about technology policy. Uh, that said, uh, the, um, what's, what was striking to me very often uh, was the disconnect between the way in which uh, some of the policy conversations about, for example, net neutrality were happening compared to the way the network engineers I spoke with, the way they talked about them. Uh, there was a moment uh, with the, the SOPA and PIPA debate uh, just about a year ago now where I was confused w uh, why all my network engineer sources were not up in arms about this. There was kind of no chatter. They were ignoring it. And they said it doesn't, it's, it's so crazy, we couldn't do it. You know, if, if, if it actually happened, we just, we couldn't execute it. You know, and it seemed to me as if, uh, you know, the you know, airline pilot, pilots were suddenly asked to fly their planes upside down. The disconnect was that great. Uh, I do ever, I should add, have a bit of Stockholm Syndrome with my, my network engineer captors. Uh, I do now kind of see the, the internet through their eyes. Uh, and I, I have not yet, I, I can say, sort of immersed myself in, the, in, the, in, in, in really the opposite view in, in, the, in, the, in, in the policy discussion. Andrew Blum, in the uh, con construct of the internet, uh, we're hearing a lot about the cloud, the so-called cloud now. Uh, mm -hmm. How does that fit in? Uh, the cloud is all of it. Um, you know, the, the, the cloud is, you know, is, the, is the marketing term for you know, for, 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 the, for the, the way in which the internet as a whole can offer business services. Uh, what that means more specifically, uh, perhaps, is a, a, data, a, a large data center, a kind of data warehouse, uh, perhaps not in Ashburn, Virginia, but in the next town over. But it's in the next town over because it it's, has to tether in, it has to connect directly, as directly as possible, to the, distrib the distribution depot, you might say, of Ashburn, Virginia. You know, Ashburn is the place where where bandwidth is most abundant and cheapest, it's the place with the most direct connections to the, the you know to, to the most other places, 
Uh, and when you are dealing with the cloud, when perhaps it might be your email or your backup or some, some uh, program you use to manage your Salesforce or whatever it is, uh, you want it to operate as smoothly as possible, as much like it's on your, com as much like it, like it's sitting on your own computer, and and that means being as closely tied to these major network hubs as possible. Now, in our discussion in the past half hour, we've talked about generators and and wires and mm -hmm. rooms with air conditioners and et cetera. How green is the internet? Uh, the internet is 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 surprisingly green. Uh, there um there there was a bit of a, a bit of a hubbub a couple months ago now, uh, with the for example the, the New York Times series on on the on the cloud factories on the the the, the enormous amounts of energy consumed uh, by 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 some of these massive data centers. Uh, what what impressed me in my visit to the internet. Uh, was the the efforts towards efficiency, particularly at the the top of the business, particularly the 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 the, the Googles and the Facebooks and the and the Yahoos, uh, all striving toward, towards making their data centers as efficient as possible, and all recognizing quite clearly that it's often more efficient to to keep your stuff on you know on this, this uh, in, in this massive machine than it is to have it on a machine sitting you know humming on your desk. Uh, so you know I, I um there's a a, a um, a, um, a, a professor at Stanford whose name I, has just escaped me, but who, who points out that uh, you know information technology only uses about two percent of, of of energy, but when you when you poll people about how much energy they think it uses, uh, they'll readily say fifty percent because our our lives are so intertwined with these machines. Uh, but every time you kind of you know look under rocks, it turns out that it's actually you know quite quite an efficient way of of, of doing business. And uh, Andrew Blum, if you had, if you could, if, or if you have aggregated the amount of investment put in the internet infrastructure, what what would it be? How much? Uh, it's it's not a number. I have I have I have at my fingertips. I, I can say that um that a lot of uh, the the most the, the the internet is robust because of the enormous amounts of money that were put into it during the broadband boom, money that then just evaporated, that then was sort of lost to shareholders. Uh, but we're better off for the 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 uh, that initial overbuilding. Uh, we've now entirely grown into it. So, have you satisfied your curiosity about the internet? <laughs> uh, to a certain extent, I have. I, I have to say that um that uh, that Sandy these last two weeks really re reminded me uh, of uh, you know of 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 how important and how you know intertwined and 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 how fascinating. Uh, the way in which this infrastructure we've created uh, has has sort of uh, you know built itself up in our on our cities and in our coasts and you know right you know brought me right back to, to square one in terms of piquing my curiosity about how all of these systems fit together not just uh, not not just the internet but the you know uh, but but power and aviation and all of these 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 large incredibly complicated things uh, that we depend on so much. Tubes is the name of the book, A Journey to the Center of the Internet, and Andrew Blum is the author. This is The Communicators on C-SPAN.